Hi, this is David. I want to read to you, starting right now, from John chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 16, a familiar verse, but we'll go on from there a little bit and continue on down. It starts out in the HCSB version, and if you prefer King James, please feel free to look it up and read it there. It says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but... Anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Look at that. You see how balanced things are? God loves, but God condemns. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. God is just and God is loving. But he is not loving without being just. He is not kind without being righteous. He does not save except that he also condemns for sin. You see, he loved you enough that he sent his son to live a perfect life, to die in absolute utter agony nailed to a cross, to shed his perfect blood as the perfect sacrifice for your sin and mine. He loved you that much and he sent Jesus and Jesus loved you enough that he willingly allowed them to nail him to the cross. And that's the truth. But the other truth is that God is holy and God is righteous and God's standard for entrance into heaven and eternal life is absolute sinless perfection. Now if you ever broke the slightest commandment of God, you're lost, you're condemned. And you have, and I have, and we all have. And the first time we knowingly committed a sin, we were condemned. That's pretty simple stuff. But God saw us in our condemnation and he sent Jesus to die on the cross to shed his blood to pay for our sin. But God's standard is still absolute perfection. Now Jesus was absolutely perfect. He lived his entire life, all 33 years, without sin, in sinless perfection. And he, being the Son of God on the Father's side and the Son of Man on his mother's side, was absolutely without even original sin. There was no sin on him that would have come down through Adam and through his Father because his Father was the Holy Spirit. His Father was God Almighty. His father was sinless, almighty God, so he was born without sin, and he lived a life where he was tempted, the Bible says, in all ways, just as we are, but he was without sin. And he died, and the fact that he was sinless allowed him not only to die, but to die for you. Now you can accept that. You can believe that. And the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you will be saved. That you confess that God raised him from the dead, that he is Lord, then you 
will be saved. But that's a heart belief, not just a head acknowledgement. And what's the difference? Well, I can believe in my head and not change my life. Nothing changes. But a heart belief will change you. It won't make you perfect. Not instantly, not now, not this side of heaven will you be perfect. However, it will very definitely change the direction of your life. And you will no longer live in sin. Although you may fall and you may sin, you are not going to continue living in a sinful lifestyle. You're going to get out of that. A faith that doesn't change you has not, will not, cannot, never will save you. If the faith that you claim to have in Jesus Christ has allowed you to continue in sin without any change, if you're still living in a sexually impure, immoral relationship, if you're still going out every single Friday night and getting falling down drunk and you've been doing it for years and claiming you're a Christian, well, you're lying to yourself, you're lying to God, and you're lying to others. And when you die, you're going to bust hell wide open. I'll tell you that. Because a faith that doesn't change you will not save you. So we have to have a faith in God that's strong enough that it allows God to change our lives. And we begin to agree with him that that which he calls evil is evil and that which he calls good is good. And we do what is good and we ask him for help and we ask him for strength. And over a period of time, we really truly begin to overcome most sin. And our sinful lifestyle just sort of disappears into the background not the first day usually not the first week or the first year but over a period of time it begins to subside and go away and we find that we're living a christian lifestyle but what about those who refuse jesus now jesus said that those who don't believe in him are condemned already well of course they are because they have sinned and the first time they sinned they were condemned. God is not going to condemn them on Judgment Day. They've already been condemned. God is going to sentence them. God is going to throw them into the lake of fire. But they're already condemned. There's no trial. They're condemned. They stand guilty of their sin. And they will be just condemned they already are condemned and that means an eternity in hell and that may be hard and you may not like that but it's true but why because God is perfect and God is holy number one and God cannot tolerate sin number one God cannot tolerate sin and God is not going to allow sin into heaven Never. Not going to happen. Number two, God loved you enough that he sent Jesus to die on a cross, and Jesus loved you enough that he voluntarily allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, and he shed his perfect blood for your sin. And if you reject him, that makes God very, very angry. And the wrath of God, I know that's unpopular. I mean, you lose your congregation if you're a preacher and you start talking about the wrath of God. Uh, tithes and offerings go through the cellar. People quit putting money in the plate. I understand all that. But the truth is the Bible talks about the wrath of God. And that the wrath of God is poured out on sinners. And how much do you think the wrath of God is going to be poured out on those who, having heard the truth, reject the truth? Those who, having seen the witness of Almighty God in nature, in the universe, in the stars, in everything around them, having seen the truth of God, refuse to seek Him? 
refused to accept his will and refused to accept the gift of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So I would encourage you today that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, or if you thought you accepted Jesus Christ, but nothing's ever changed in your life, I would ask you to just pray right now. Agree with God that what God calls sin is sin. And that what you have done is sin. And that what you have done is worthy of death. Agree with him. And then tell him that you're sorry and ask him for strength not to do that anymore. And then tell him that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That you believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross for you and shed his blood for you and ask God in Jesus' name to apply that blood to you, to cleanse you, to save you, to make you over and to make you whole. We're going to talk a lot more about balance in the coming days because balance is everything. You know, when I talk against the legalists, all of the hyper-grace people jump on Facebook and say, Oh, David, you're so wonderful. You're getting all of those crazy legalists. And when I jump on the hyper-grace people, all of the legalists come on Facebook and start commenting, and commenting about how great I am and how wonderful it is that I am coming down hard on all of those lawless people. But when I come down hard on the lawless people, they accuse me of being in the legalistic camp. And when I come down hard on the legalists, they accuse me of being in the hyper-grace lawless camp. But the truth is in the middle. And we're going to talk about that next time. God bless you. Have a great day. And if you don't know Jesus, find him now.